Eric Schmidt, um, love the man. He's amazing. He's been an incredible benefactor of the XPRIZE, uh, and he's a, uh, a very expansive thinker. Uh, in the news this week, uh, a couple of comments that he's made, uh, one about AI models and one about whether Google is losing the race with OpenAI and why. Let's talk about the, uh, what he said this, this uh, week about what's coming up next year. Uh, Salim, why don't you cover that one? I'll cover the, uh, the Google. Yeah, you know when you race. look at when you look at how evolution works, right? You take half your genes from your mother and half your genes from your father, and you cross it, and then survival bias and na natural selection will pick the best traits going forward. And I think what's happening here is we've developed these different threads in AI. And in the case of Eric, he says we've got large context windows, agents, and text action. So we take the kind of genetic capabilities. I'm using the term loosely. And now you combine them, the potential outputs and the outcomes will be really powerful, incredibly, uh, 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 incredibly powerful. And I think I'm incredibly excited where AI goes with this. Yeah, I mean, what could possibly go wrong? I mean, so <laughs> large context windows, I mean, just to, to dive into each of those elements here, we're talking about, you know, loading in books and ultimately libraries and movies, everything and having, you know, so one of the future versions of AIs are AIs on on your in your uh, your employee team, right? So you can imagine having an AI agent who steps in uh, for marketing or design or you know tech, and it yeah. reads it reads every email ever written inside your organization. It reads uh, every Slack channel, and so on day one, that AI employee knows everything and is able to hold all of that in context that's incredible so right. for me this becomes like the the slide rule to excel spreadsheet shift right uh, every single employee every single manager will have access to multiple agents that has right. access and can look at all the information in a firm co collectively and will just become better decision making engines again in one vector but i think this is huge the potential here is unbelievable and then text to action is the fact that we're, you know, AIs don't live uh, in full isolation. There is a point now where you can say to your AI, cook me dinner, um, you know, go and find this information, go physically, you know, clean this thing. I mean, especially we'll talk about robots in a little bit, where mm -hmm. robots become, you know, physical extensions of AIs in the world. Um, the ability for AIs to, uh, have agentic capability. I know you love that word. <laughs> well, I think once you have an AI that can program, right, yeah. which we cross that Rubicon with uh, GPT three and four, um, you essentially have the ability for any AI to impact the real world. Yeah. Um, because so many of our devices are programmable devices, and we're essentially turning the world into into information, which they can then be programmed. And therefore, uh, we've crossed that divide, and now. Uh, and AI has true agency in terms of what it can achieve in the physical world. There's a really important other piece of just to be uh, go here, uh, relating back to the other one, which is that when we talk about intelligence, um, it turns out that the need, the evolution of intelligence was almost completely the adaptive need to navigate in the physical world. And so again, let's cover that more in the robotics part, but that's a huge uh, rationale for why evolution created intelligence and neocortex cortex have functions in the first place. All right, let's talk about the second one, Google losing open AI. You know, I've got to imagine that at the executive conversations at Google, they're like, WTF is going on here? We, you know, how did we possibly get into this situation? Well, here's what uh, Eric thinks uh, made them uh, second tier to open AI in some areas. Google decided that work-life balance and going home early and working from home was more important than winning. The reason startups work is because the people work like hell. And I'm sorry to be so blunt, but the fact of the matter is if you all leave the university and go found a company, you're not going to let people work from home and only come in one day a week. Wow. Pretty damn spot on and ballsy of Eric to say that. Um, and I listen, I know this is, okay, maybe we're going to disagree on this, right? Because in the whole EXO model, you know, it's like just distributed and all those benefits. But listen, the companies that 
I've seen, I've invested in, the companies I've built, when you're there in the thick of it physically all together seven days a week, you got to believe that, you know, I, I just went and, and visited um, <clears throat> uh, Zipline um, and yeah. I just did a podcast with the, with the CEO of Zipline. And when I was physically there, the energy, right, of, you know, hundreds of people like literally crammed into this office with dashboards up on the walls. You don't get that virtually. You don't get that kind of energy, that kind of drive. I mean, it's a new organism that comes out. When I was at Figure uh, with Brett Adcock, you know, the team is there, you know, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day, just, and they're excited about what they're building. I don't know, work from home? Okay. Uh, this, I think these are two different topics that he's conflating here, and I, I take the very, very big risk of disagreeing with Eric, okay. which is one who is one of the smartest and wisest people in the world. Um, I think the work from home versus physical presence does have a factor, and I totally agree with you there. Right? There's an energy that comes from, like for example, we just had a massive win at OpenEXO, and I can't I can't high five anybody around me. And there's a big <laughs> loss from that that connection, that human connection. Go straight back to the comment we just had around um, uh, human beings and being physically in the mode. We uh, you know year for years we thought virtual uh, conferences would take over real conferences, but people love the scarcity of the human connection, and conference in person conferences are more popular than ever. So I completely get the in person versus remote work. And the difference there. I disagree that that's the reason that AI is opening as beating uh, Google. And I'll mm. take you back to Facebook. Okay? okay. Um, Facebook beat Yahoo and MySpace and Google, et cetera, with a very simple um, organizational heuristic, which was Zuckerberg said to his developers if you think your code is ready to ship, just go live on the live site. You better make sure you've tested the hell out of it. Uh, but but and the 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 developers had this unbelievable sense of empowerment, and they were like, "Wow, the the trust he trusts us with this, amazing!" And they were putting out features uh, ten times faster than Yahoo or MySpace or Google. Okay, uh, it comes down to organizational design. The mm. fact that in Google, if you talk to Google employees today to try and get anything done, there's so much bureaucracy. Yeah, it's taking forever to do. That's the thing that's slowing it down. I think he's conflating those two things. Operating in a big company today means you have these control framework layers, et cetera. And I've got all sorts of war stories from Yahoo about this. The, the, the reason Yahoo failed was Terry Selmel by accident put in a classic matrix structure to manage the company. Um, and that structure is great for uh, um, a scaling and control, but it's terrible for taking risk yeah. and it's terrible for speed. And if you're on the consumer internet, the two attributes you better have are speed and risk. You look at Google and how much investment they put into Google Plus. Uh, they had all the world's top researchers. The product oh is God. absolutely brilliant, but all the internal hurdles of having to navigate should it connect with the YouTube ID system and whatever. Basically, by the time they got through all of that, Facebook was gone. And so this is the issue, I think, is the internal organizational design, much, much more so than whether people are coming in day work. I do agree. I do agree with you there, right? Agility, agility always wins, you know, and, and- And we've studied this to death in the EXO model, right? And I'll just carry out this little quick plug here. We studied the Fortune 100 and said, okay, um, how many of these use the EXO model or the attributes in the model, like the autonomous teams, community, dashboards, whatever. Um, and we found that in the Fortune 100 over a seven year period, the companies that followed the model the most delivered 40 times the shareholder returns than the companies that followed the model the least. So really it comes down to the organizational design as a main heuristic for survival in the future. In the, and, and this is where companies will end up following this structure because we now have so much proof the more of the model you use, the better you'll do. So I think, I think the, without realizing it, Eric is commenting on the organizational structure of Google versus OpenAI being comprised of small teams that are just doing whatever the hell they want. And the sad thing, of course, you know, we, and I discussed this with Eric when, when he was with us at, at, uh, at Abundance last year, <clears throat> at the Abundance Summit, was that Google had a massive lead, right, in AI uh, ahead of everybody and was actually being respectful and careful and not putting it out before it was fully tested. And then when uh, 
when Sam Altman put out, you know, chat GPT, it was like, okay, gloves are off, you know, put on the racing sneakers, let's go. And, and to give them full credit, they've responded incredibly well. Gemini is amazing what yeah. it can do. Right? Yeah, I mean, so, I, I don't want to take anything away from Google. I, I, they are the juggernaut. I would still never bet against them. But uh, they're, they're, they've, got, uh, they've got real competition. It's the curse of being a big company. The control frameworks that you have to put in place prevent you from being nimble. And today, the name of the game is being nimble.